I believe that it, it, it's the prayer that goes on in heaven which generates the power and the way that the power is translated or transferred from heaven to earth is through the saints on earth connecting with that prayer meeting in heaven. Well, here we are. We're talking to Brian Pickering. Who is Brian Pickering? He's the coordinator for the Australian Prayer Network. He coordinated Spirit Alive, which we're going to find out about through the 80s and into the early 90s. Incredible ministry. Um, he, with a group of many other prayer warriors, brought together people in 2007 for a National Solemn Assembly in Canberra, uh, which was very significant to pray for a miracle for the drought that was on at that time. And guess what? The drought broke. God answers people's prayers, especially collectively and especially when they come in a humble heart and repent. Brian has done so, so many things. He's a career executive in um, banking and he's passionate for prayer. He's been crisscrossing the country for the last uh, four or five years, six years, seven years maybe, uh, doing prayer schools, teaching people how to pray with a wonderful team of other helpers. And today we're talking to Brian Pickering. Great to be talking to you today, And with Brian. you, Warwick. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah. So, Brian, how did the journey of faith start for you? Well, I was, uh, I was born into a Christian family. Uh, in fact, my uh, father was a Methodist minister. So I've uh, known uh, the church and uh, a life of faith ever since I was born. But it wasn't probably until uh, my father died in my mid-twenties <clears throat> that I, uh, I made a, a personal commitment to keep following Jesus. I had been following him and uh, no question about that. But I knew that uh, uh, my father had died, so he had no further influence in my life. And so I had to uh, make my own decision to, to follow Jesus. And so in my mid-twenties, I made that decision, even though I'd been following him all my life. I made a, a very conscious decision that I was going to make uh, do that personally myself without the influence of my family. And um, your passion for prayer, tell us how did that come to you? You obviously got a deep passion to pray and also to gather people to prayer and also pray for the nation of Australia. You've got a weekly newsletter that comes out, which is amazing. You've got an Israel report once a week that comes out, which is amazing. And people can register at the Australian Prayer Network website. We'll talk about that a bit later. Why this passion? What's the what's the story behind it? Well, I, I actually never saw myself uh, as a, a prayer warrior. Um, you know, I, I knew prayer was an important aspect of my Christian walk. But uh, when God called me uh, and told me that he wanted me to, to move into the whole area of prayer and, uh, and intercession, I actually said to him, Lord, I think you got the wrong guy. Um, because I, I didn't at that point of time uh, feel that I was uh, a, an expert or in any way even called to that. But I followed the, the leading that he, he gave me. And uh, over the years, of course, uh, it's developed to where uh, today, I'm, uh, and for the last 30 years, I've been leading the Australian Prayer Network. But I don't see myself primarily as an intercessor. I believe my gift to the prayer movement is one of leadership and facilitation and encouragement and understanding the heart of the intercessor. And so uh, I'm a man of prayer, obviously, but there are many, many more people who, uh, who uh, pray uh, much, much longer to periods of time than I do. Uh, and it's those people that I try to harness and, and uh, encourage and facilitate uh, so that their ministry uh, reaches into areas that they couldn't otherwise reach into, but through the doors that I'm able to open as a leader uh, and as a facilitator. So, uh, so, so my passion for prayer has, has come out of a calling, uh, out of an observation that uh, as I walk down this road, I've seen God work many, many miracles, and I realise and understand the power of prayer. Uh, and so I, I delight in, in encouraging those with a particular gift of intercession and spiritual warfare and so forth. I delight in, in encouraging them, teaching them, training them 
and facilitating them to exercise their ministry of prayer across the nation. Incredible, yeah. Tell us about the Spirit Alive ministry. When did it start? And how you used to go out and have these incredible prayer, 40 hour prayer relays for lo locations? Yeah, that was uh, probably in about 1984 when we first formed uh, that ministry called Spirit Alive that's now morphed into the Australian Prayer Network. And as we look back now, we see that they were our training years. And in those training years, uh, God had been taking me to many places around Australia, making contact with different folk. And those folk became a prayer army, if you like, a small prayer army. You know, a hundred or more people who, uh, who uh, were willing to do whatever God asked them to do. Uh, and, and over a period of time, God began to open up uh, opportunity for us to have uh, prayer weekends. Uh, they morphed into ministry, into cities at the invitation of churches. Churches would invite us to come and to uh, spend uh, uh, not just a weekend, but sometimes up to 18 months in training their people how to pray for their city. Uh, and we would bring in our intercessors from across Australia. Uh, and they would travel at their own expense, fly into uh, uh, into another city uh, or another community somewhere in Australia. Uh, and they would do that roughly every six weekends. Every six weeks, we would have a 40-hour prayer weekend somewhere. Uh, most of them at the invitation of churches. And so we spent uh, we didn't spend time 18 months in the city uh, every every day, but we would come back uh, every six weeks for 18 months and have these things, training the local church, the local people, as well as encouraging our people to, to join with us. Uh, that was that was our training area. Uh, well, we trained a bit before that. That was part of our uh, exercise of going out and doing what we'd learnt. And we learnt so much uh, uh, during those years and uh, that stood us in wonderful stead for what the Lord's got us doing now. You probably would have seen some, at, I remember, you know, at that time, uh, certainly talking to you, I think I only really met you maybe late 80s, early 90s. Um, you told us some incredible miracles that took place. Can you tell us a couple of those miracles? Yeah, well, we've done all sorts of things. You know, when, when we go into a city, we, we, uh, we connect with uh, all the authorities in the city, the councils, the police, the schools, the hospitals, uh, all of those people. We go and pray with them and for them. Um, the churches open the doors for us and um, we take the intercessors in. So uh, one, uh, one of the stories that stands out for me was that uh, we went to the police at one point and uh, uh, the chief uh, police officer in the police station became very, very interested in what we were doing. What region uh, was it, Brian? Sorry? What region was it? In New South Wales, in country New South Wales. Mm -hmm. oh, well, not, no, I would put it out of suburban Sydney in New South Wales. And so... Mm -hmm. uh, what they would do, what he said was, uh, you know, we said, well, look, if there's any way we can help you, if we can pray for you, if you've got any situations that you'd like us to pray into, we please do. And he brought up a, a situation in which he said as being, uh, you know, we've been concerned about this area and we haven't had any breakthroughs. Would you be prepared to pray with us? And what it was, was that there were a lot of um, uh, headstones in a cemetery which were constantly being desecrated. And... Uh, uh, he thought that there were vandals coming in at night and, and doing that sort of stuff. So he said to us, uh, you know, would you pray about it? And we said, look, we, we believe this is a spiritual thing. We, we think that there might be occultists who are using the graveyard for their ceremonies and so forth. So, yes, we will pray. And so we prayed and we uh, didn't have any further contact for an, uh, about six weeks with that uh, policeman. But when we came back the next time, he said to us, you wouldn't believe what's happened. And we said, what? He said, we've found the culprits who were going into the into the cemetery and uh, and having their ceremonies and so forth. So we were able to arrest them and charge them. And we said, well, there's an answer to prayer. How did it happen? He said, well, he said, well, we, we actually picked up a car that was speeding uh, and, uh, uh, and we searched the car and looked in the glove box and there was a DVD or a, a video. Uh, so we decided to play it. And the video was of these people in the uh, in the cemetery actually desecrating the graves, and so they were caught red-handed because it was all on all on video and DVD. Uh, and so that was uh, one answer to prayer that uh, that uh, sticks in my mind. Uh, another one was when we were praying in a country town, and uh, 
our team was uh, housed in the local caravan park. Uh, and uh, and so uh, because it was a 40-hour prayer weekend, we prayed right through the night. We had people praying right through the night. And uh, uh, we finished the weekend, went away, and a few weeks later we had a phone call from one of the ministers and he said, you wouldn't believe what's happened in our town. And we said, what? He said, well, you know, you stayed in that caravan park. And we said, yeah, we did. He said, would you believe that every person in that caravan park, and there was a permanence they were, not every person in the caravan park, but the permanence, of which there were about six or eight who lived there permanently. He said, in the last few weeks, every one of those six people have come to the Lord. He said, uh, that prayer that you did on the Saturday night or when you were there was so powerful that it actually impacted the lives. Now, we didn't even know those people were there. We weren't praying for them specifically. But we were praying, and we were praying in God's will, and uh, and so God was able to perform the miracle He wanted to perform, even though we didn't even know what was going on. Incredible, Brian! Incredible stories. I'm sure you got hundreds of others as well. And Spirit Alive, if I understand, morphed into Australian yeah. Prayer Network probably yeah. around about ninety three, ninety four, from my calculations. That's correct. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Tell us a bit more about what you do. What are the things you things you offer people in uh, Australian Prayer Network? Well, we uh, we've had various seasons, and, and our story is in seasons. And uh, uh, you know, one of the seasons was ministering in cities, and that went on for about six years, where we were invited to, by the churches, as I mentioned before, to go and pray in those cities. That was a strategic part of our ministry. Um, We've run significant national events uh, like the uh, uh, National Prayer Gathering, um, which was held uh, uh, at Uluru uh, back in, around the year 2000. We've done British-Australian reconciliation with uh, teams of intercessors coming from Britain to do those sorts of things. We've done Vietnam War reconciliation, healing the wounds of our nation. Uh, we've done a National Solemn Assembly in Canberra at Parliament House. And we were the uh, we were the custodians of the National Day of Thanksgiving for uh, for, for many years. So um, we've done a lot of those national events. We also we keep in touch with our with our uh, membership uh, by sending out newsletters, and we do three or four newsletters a week: one on international, one on Australian, Israel news, and feature articles and so forth. And so we have uh, a 24/7 prayer watch which has been going now for 22 years, uh, covering the nation 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We have several thousand people on that prayer watch. And so we have prayer going 24 hours a day, as I said, seven days a week, and have had it for the last 22 years. And so we believe that's also been used by God to bring some stability into our nation. And, uh, uh, and uh, you know, that's, that's been a powerful uh, part of our ministry. Uh, and uh, so there you are. That's what we do and what we have done. And uh, at the moment, we're in this teaching set, um, era, uh, season, if you like. Uh, and uh, God laid on our heart about seven or eight years ago to actually um, uh, begin to teach the next generations that are following us all the things that we'd learned over 30 years of national ministry. And so we've been holding those schools, um, interrupted by COVID, of course. But uh, in the five or six years leading up to COVID that we held the schools, uh, some 16,000 people did the course. So we've trained 16,000 intercessors in teaching them all we've taught, been taught over the years. And we believe that's the next generation that will follow us when, uh, as you can see, I'm nearing my retirement. And so when I retire, the others hopefully will be able to step into my shoes and, and follow on and continue to do what we've been doing over the last 30 years. Look, it's incredible, incredible what you've done, Brian, in the nation, and thank God for you. There's three levels in that. Um, if you just tell us about those three levels in the uh, course. Uh, there's three levels, a foundation level for beginners, um, and we, we even um, put all the trained intercessors through the foundation course because uh, we've had it said to us, we've heard stuff here we've never knew ourselves. And so the foundation level course is the first step, which moves up to an intermediate level, and then finally an advanced level course. And then we have some practicums that uh, people can also do at the end of that. Uh, so uh, uh, each course is takes a, you know over a weekend, uh, and it, uh, 
uh, there's no no cost uh, love offerings we operate by love offering no cost um, and people uh, uh, we used to like them to do it in order foundation intermediate and advanced but now as we uh, uh, as all that's going on with COVID and people aren't able to to, to do things in as ordered a manner as they used to we do allow people now just to come in at whatever level they can and catch up on other things by DVD or, or whatever mm, that's great Actually, just tell you, for you, just a bit of interesting information. It might be interesting to other people. So I was with you in 2003, and we sat in the parliament with um, Mike Jeffs and many other people, prayer people, uh, people interested in Christian values, and we had a discussion that Australia needed a day of prayer. And uh, I'm not sure if it was yourself or someone suggested a, a day of Thanksgiving, and we all agreed we should do that. Remember that? Yeah, I do remember that. Yes, yeah, sorry. Uh, yes, I do remember that. And that, of course, led us to go to see the Governor General and the Prime Minister yeah. and the Leader of the Opposition. And all of them yeah. gave their uh, uh, their blessing on running such a day and left it to, to us and those who, uh, who represented the Christian community to organise a day which they wanted celebrated by all Australians, not just by Christians. And so we had the endorsement of the Governor General, the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition. And the National Day of Thanksgiving, you know, went for around about 15 years. And then COVID hit. And of course, you know, people were locked away and people couldn't do things and it just changed the whole landscape. So it hasn't been possible to, to have the National Day of Thanksgiving over the last couple of years. Uh, it was a mammoth exercise in the sense that uh, when you organise something nationally, it does take a lot of time and a lot of money. And, uh, and our sponsors uh, felt that uh, uh, with the loss of two years uh, of, of holding events, that it probably was going to be too much to re try and rekindle from scratch. So, uh, so we, we've, we've laid that down. Um, and uh, I know that there's been others that may be interested in taking it up, but uh, uh, we'll see what God does. Well, I'll tell you that it's a, a bit of a very interesting story to add to that. So as you know, I rang you and I said, look, Brian, is it okay if I keep the National Day of Thanksgiving going? You said, yes, you know, go ahead. Talk, you talk to your team. They said, yes. And so I was fully working towards this year, having, you know, celebrating the National Day of Thanksgiving on the last Saturday in May, as it has been done for the last um, uh, 10 or so years. And what's happened is the National Day of Prayer and Fasting um, have felt they wanted to change the date because February is a bit awkward as far as because you, you're trying to organize stuff in, in, in December, January with churches, everyone's away, holidays. It's really hard to get the momentum up. And they picked, guess what? They picked the, the, the last Saturday or the, the, the Saturday immediately before um, uh, Pentecost. And that's why you picked that date. And I thought, well, there's the hand of the Lord there because that date was kept by you. It was originally intended as a day of prayer. Uh, now that that day, uh, Thanksgiving has now morphed into a national day of prayer and fasting, and you and I both know we desperately need it. And I thought, well, you know, there's the hand of the Lord. I just felt, well, I think we need to release the national day of Thanksgiving um, and let this grow in its place. So isn't that amazing? Yeah, it is. Uh, and I when I when I saw that, I thought, wow, you know, that's. Uh... Uh, just as well we laid it down. <laughs> Otherwise, it would have yeah, I mean, I think I do think looking at now that you know because I was thinking, oh, you know, why is Brian laying this down? But you know, I, I know the work involved too. It's massive, just a massive work to run a national day is a massive job. So please thank Brian for all the work he's done. Like massive amount of work behind the scenes. Um, but yeah, I just think it's great to see. So there's in a in a, in a funny way that Thanksgiving is now going back to prayer, which we had that original discussion. We were all happy to have a National Day of Thanksgiving, but now it's 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 actually becoming a National Day of Prayer and Fasting, which yep. I'm personally excited about it. I'm no longer on the team because it's great to have a, you know, other people come in and uh, other new generation people take it over. So um, I'm like you, I'm, I've got to sort of release things to the next generation. Yep. And um, so, yeah, so I'm pretty glad about that. Um, the power of prayer and fasting. Prayer and fasting is very powerful. Why do you think it is powerful, Brian, in your experience? 
because it touches the heart of God. It, it actually reflects the heart of God. Um, I, I believe and we teach that prayer isn't, that, isn't an activity uh, uh, that man engages in. It's actually an activity of God, which is a continuous, uh, there's a continuous 24-7 prayer meeting happening in heaven. And when we pray, we actually link into that prayer meeting. So, so prayer and intercession and all that goes with it, prayer and fasting, spiritual warfare, is on the heart of God. Uh, and it's actually the outworking of what God wants to happen in our world because it actually transforms and changes the circumstances that we face on earth. And so uh, I don't see prayer as something that we do. I see prayer as something that God does that we cooperate with and we are the arms and legs of God to make it happen and influence what happens here on earth. So that's probably slightly different as to what some people think of prayer, but that's what I that's what I believe prayer is. Therefore, it's very powerful. Yeah, I'll come back to prayer and fasting, but I do actually agree with you. The more I pray, Brian, and you can comment on this, the more I pray, the more I realise that it's the grace of God that God gives us to pray. Yeah. I feel as if it's we can't take credit when we pray. Because God's allowing us to pray and, and God, you know, gives us the grace to pray. Um, and as you said, it's him praying through us because it says in the scripture that uh, Jesus ever lives to make intercession for us, the right hand of God. Uh, your comment on that? Yeah, well, exactly right. Uh, as I say, I believe that it, it, it's the prayer that goes on in heaven which generates the power and the way that the power is translated or transferred from heaven to earth is through the saints on earth connecting with that prayer meeting in heaven and acting as a conduit. Like a, it's like an electricity wire. Uh, and, and the conduit is the intercession, prayer and intercession engaged in by people on earth. But the power comes from the power station, which is the prayer meeting in heaven. And so, uh, so we encourage people uh, to, to engage with that prayer meeting in heaven because that's where the power is and the power that generates from there is life-changing both for individuals and for nations and everything in between. Yeah. Getting back to prayer and fasting, I would argue in all my experience there's something incredible happens when there's, a, you know, as Bruce, uh, you know, Bruce says, Lindley says, um, corporate prayer shifts nations and I have seen it again now our nation has not come back to Christ our nation is not a revival our nation is still actually sadly dropping down but you know I mean personally speaking I, 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 I'm passionate for marriage I'm passionate for family and I was involved in a lot of 40 day fasts for marriage in this nation now we're um, sadly a very secular country incredible strong Christian heritage but we are the last nation, the last nation in the Western world to legalize homosexual marriage. And I would argue, and I was surprised because America did it before us and they actually got more Christians per square, square inch than, than Australia, right? And, um, you know, I'm just wondering if it's that, that, consi that incredible, because people were doing this, the Catholic Church called for it. We called for it. Um, and you, you were a party to it as well. And it's as if God did something special. And I found personally in my own life for breakthrough when I set aside, you know, in a, say I've got an, I need a, a challenge and I often set aside three days to pray and fast or one day, you know, or seven days, whatever it is. Things happen, things shift. It's just like extraordinary. Any comments about prayer and fasting? Well, our policy normally is to allow people to make that decision themselves because you either you either know the power of fasting or it's a mystery to you and and so therefore you don't engage so rather than put a stumbling block before people we let people make that decision of whether they pray and fast themselves but of course fasting is biblical and so uh, mm. when we fast we make a conscious decision to do without the things of this earth in order to spend more time connecting with God in heaven. So that's the power of fasting, is it is, it is turning away from the things of this earth 
and turning on to our relationship with God. So I believe that's where the power of fasting is. Um, and, uh, and that's why some people fast food, some people fast watching television, some people fast other things, you know. But it's the turning away from the things of this earth to concentrate on the things of, uh, of, of, of heaven and, and God's will and purpose for our time. So that's why it's powerful. Uh, and, uh, mm -hmm. But you have to come under that conviction yourself. Mm -hmm. I don't think it works if people just do it because it's a thing they've been told to do. It's got to come yeah. from the heart. Yeah. I've thought a lot about this, Brian, uh, for many, many years, many, 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 many years. And uh, I've been, you know, saying, why is this so powerful? What's the secret behind it? And my, uh, love your comment on this, my comment, it, the, the scripture says a lot about humility, right? It says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Um, you know, uh, God's looking for, you know, people of humility, people who walk in humility. And as it says in Micah 6, 8, uh, three things the Lord requires of you uh, to act um, in walking humility, do justly, and I've forgotten the third one, but that's the, the first, I think the first one is humility. So I believe that fasting is about humbling yourself. Yeah. It's to do with, it's to do with coming before God because humbling makes you weak. Yeah. I'm currently fasting right now and I'm, I'm, I occasionally drop a word or drop or whatever. And you know, the, the brain, the, the blood sugar is not getting to the brain. So, and it's uncomfortable, but it's the uncomfortableness, if you like, and the weakness in the other scripture I'd use would be that God makes his strength perfect in weakness. So it's somehow to do with humility. What are your thoughts about that? Yeah, that's right. We, we humble ourselves before God. And that's what 2 Chronicles seven fourteen says, you know, if uh, those who are called by his name will humble themselves and pray, that's when he acts. And so uh, when we humble ourselves in an act of giving up something that we actually need, because we need food to sustain ourselves in, in the longer term, and when we give that up for a period of time, it shows to God that we're serious uh, in being humble before him and being willing to be used by him in whatever form he chooses to use us. And so our prayers therefore become more powerful because that we have, we have deliberately uh, humbled ourselves, given up something which is important to our earthly bodies in order to communicate and be part of the uh, spiritual realm connecting with God in heaven. 100%, 100%. Um, with the, you know, we're talking about before we started this interview, we're just off, offline talking about the the, the the current situation in our nation. And you and I have been around for, you know, um, many, 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 many decades. And we've seen the gradual decline uh, of morals, gradual decline of everything. What do you think it, right now, um, 2022, what's your observation of the nation would come up to election as well? What, do you th what are your concerns at the present moment in our nation? Well, I'm concerned overall for the, uh, for the direction of our nation. And I don't, know, I don't mean that uh, in the things of... Um, you know, um, like economics or uh, those sorts of policy issues. I, I'm very concerned about the moral decline and the decline in the Christian values that have undergirded our nation for so many years. Uh, you know, I think this uh, every election is, is important, but uh, I'm personally believing that what's most important uh, in who we decide to vote for this time is not is not based on the personalities necessarily of the leaders. It's not based on the policies because the policies between the two uh, competing parties, major parties, are, are not that dissimilar. Uh, but the values which undergird those parties, and unfortunately, each of them is um, moving further and further away from the Lord, but but values, I think, are the most important thing to, to, to uh, put our votes on righteousness and justice and how that works itself out in the way we live as as a people. Uh, to me, that's what I'll be casting my vote in relation to that. Um, because uh, we have turned away from God. There's no question about that as a nation. Um, 
there is there are many many attempts to try and and uh, neutralize or even degrade our Christian heritage and our Christian values and that's what concerns me most and certainly uh, um, you know people people don't understand uh, unless they have a spiritual perspective of life they can't understand where we are or where we will head if we continue to go down the path we're going on and so this election uh, this election I think will will determine a lot of our future as a nation even how much of a Christian heritage we retain because I believe there are forces working towards destroying our Christian heritage and our Christian faith and if the wrong people get into power it could be that that will accelerate and bring uh, things into our nation which are going to make it a difficult time for us. Yeah it's, uh, it does look um, it, you know from the point of view of the, um, the current situation does look a bit grim. My a friend of someone said to me um, a few weeks ago. They said, you know, last election 2019, um, Morrison needed a miracle. Um, this election in 2022, Australia needs a miracle. What are your thoughts? Yeah, that's right. Uh, what, what you know, what what I don't understand. I must admit, I'm I'm a bit perplexed as to. Uh, why things are happening as they're happening and so forth. But, you know, uh, many, many Christians thought that when Morrison won the last election, it was a miracle. And he confessed, you know, it was a miracle. And many people said it was a miracle. And indeed, it was a miracle. And so God gave us three years with the Christian Prime Minister uh, and, and put a stop to a lot of things that could have happened in our nation on the moral and cultural issues and so forth, put a put something of a, uh, a stop to that. And I'm perplexed as to why those same people, many of those same people, not everyone, of course, but many of those same people who called Morrison's election a miracle are now praying and voting against him, which to me seems like throwing that election victory three years ago back in the face of God and saying you made a mistake. So I am perplexed, and I, and I think that a number of people are perplexed that um, why? And I can only put it down to the spiritual battle that we're in as a nation. Uh, I think we are in the midst of spiritual warfare, not only in Australia, but right across the world. And, and that is trying to take out Christian leaders, trying to destroy Christian values. Uh, and I think uh, he's been, uh, uh, that, that's what's happened in this instance, and uh, it, it's... It means that uh, not only will we not have a Christian prime minister, but many of the Christians in parliament are also under threat. So it's a very, very serious situation. Yeah, it is. Brian, um, I really appreciate you spending time with us today. Um, hopefully people will see this YouTube and be inspired in the area of prayer. How Look, there's one thing you haven't told us. How many emails do you send out for people as you're part of your service for the Australian Prayer Network? We have, uh, well, we send, we send them out to prayer groups. We send them out to churches. Uh, and if we extrapolate out, there's about 10 people in a prayer group and maybe 100 people in a congregation uh, on an average. Uh, we would reach up to 100,000 people with our newsletters. So we, we send out uh, many thousands. Um, but it's multiplied by the fact that we send one email to 10 people or, or whatever. Um, so uh, on our database, we have about, uh, you know, 7,000 people uh, and we have connection with some, uh, we believe, uh, a couple of thousand prayer groups across the nation uh, and, uh, and many hundreds of, of churches, of course. So that's where we get our, our reach from. Not direct membership, just direct membership, but the implications of those uh, one member representing 10 people or 100 people and then passing it on to others. So it multiplies, as you know, across the internet, across the network. But that's not the only uh, only service you provide. There's a couple of other things as well. Is which? Sorry? You, don't you do the Israel newsletter? That's part of it. Yeah, that goes out to everyone as well. So there's, a, there's so that, international news. 
Australian news, they go out weekly. Israel news goes out once a month. A feature article goes out once a month. Uh, and people can pick and choose what they want to receive. They don't have to receive at all if they register with us. But, uh, um, but most of them register to receive uh, everything. Uh, and then we, uh, you know, we might send out, uh, uh, we, we send out information about what's happening uh, with our prayer schools and uh, if there's a national event on, like the National Day of Prayer, uh, we would, uh, you know, put that out across our network as well. So, uh, so it's, a, it's an information service to inform people so that they can be pray more effectively. Uh, and so, uh, um, we don't organise prayer meetings as such. Uh, the 24-7 prayer watch is run by us, but it's the, the 24-7 prayer is conducted by the people, uh, and we don't have any influence in it except giving them the prayer points that we need to pray for in the nation and so forth. Well, um, it's just incredible to talk to you. It's amazing. And thank God for Australian Prayer Network. What's the URL again? Uh, www.oz prayer net one word and the oz is a u s not oz a u s prayer net dot org dot au so if you want to uh connect with the australian prayer network go to oz prayer net dot org oz prayer net dot org dot au dot au yeah and or just put australian prayer network into the search engine it'll come up it'll, it'll come up yeah so that'd be a great way brian great way to connect with Brian and get information and get intelligence. Um, you know, it's like Brian's sort of the prayer intelligence officer for the Australian, the broad Australian uh, prayer movement. So it's great. Brian, would you like to pray, um, pray for our nation, um, pray for what's happening in our culture and also pray particularly for these elections? Father, we need you like we've never needed you before. This nation has been known as a Christian nation. We've prided ourselves on having a Christian heritage. We've prided, our, uh, we've prided ourselves on the basis that our laws are based on the word of God. But Lord, over the last number of years, that's so much of that has been taken away. And so we desperately need you. And Father, in the midst of this election campaign, where we will decide as a nation who governs us for the next three years, we need you, Lord, to search our hearts and to put your heart into our heart so that we hear your heart cry for our nation. Lord, we know that you declared this to be the great south land of the Holy Spirit. You declared that prophetically, but yet we are so far from that. Lord, we want to get back to being able to live according to your word and we want to become that great south land of the holy spirit but we know it cannot be unless we turn back to you and so father uh, individually we turn back to you and we cry out to you we ask you to hear our cry we ask you father to uh, to, to send the angels across our nation over these next 10 days ministering into the hearts and lives of the people helping them to understand things and see things that maybe they can't see in the natural and they can't understand in the natural. But uh, we ask you to open eyes and open hearts and open ears. And even if they're not Christian, Lord, move in some way within their, their own understanding to be able to see how it is that they should vote so that we continue to live and to grow as a nation which honours you and calls you the Lord of our nation. So Father, we ask you to come and we ask for more miracles this coming election. We pray for the election of godly men and women. We pray for the election of men and women who will stand for righteousness and justice. And Father, we ask that any who would oppose those things that are on your heart for our nation, that Father, that, uh, that, that, that you would remove them from our parliament so that we only have those people who are prepared to have a heart towards you, a soft heart towards you. And yet, Lord, we know that, uh, that, that sometimes we don't even know what's best for ourselves. So, Father, we, we ask if there's anything that we need to know and we need to learn ourselves, uh, make us pliable in your hands 
so that we learn the things that we need to learn and we do the things that we need to do in order to see your Lordship established in our lives and, uh, and over our whole nation. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen and amen and amen. And God bless you. Thank you so much for talking to us. It's a great honour, Brian. Thanks, Warwick, and thanks for having me. Authorised by Warwick Marsh, 182 27 Cordo Road, Mount Kembla, New South Wales 2526.